Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for the invitation here to speak. Uh, I do love this setting, as uh, both of our uh, introductory speakers uh, kicked off here, that the, the best settings for our profession and for our patients' uh, betterment is the multidisciplinary setting. And it, it really is a pleasure to be at a, a meeting like this where we know that we've got concurrent learning and we can learn from each other and share from each other and be visible to each other and realize that these are the members of the team that are walking through this exhibit hall and having breakfast together. So, uh, And yes, uh, Mike, as you mentioned, my, uh, my family uh, uh, deposited nicely at New York College of Podiatric Medicine. My grandfather and father both went there. Uh, I was a Floridian by birth, so I stuck a little closer to home for my, uh, for my schooling. But I uh, appreciate your work in education and uh, what you guys are doing there. So I have the easy job here this morning uh, of talking about causation and causal pathway for diabetic foot ulceration. Well, we're starting off with some nice, simple science. We've got some great stuff to talk about, but this really is a, a very simple problem when we look at it. We've got a lot of complicated potentials and solutions and tangents to go off of, but the core of this is really quite simple. So let's uh, click up the slides here. So epidemiology of amputation, uh, we know at this point in this country, uh, the numbers are very, very straightforward. Uh, I'm not going to hit you with 17 different statistics here this morning, but the one that I would really focus on uh, is at the bottom of this slide, because uh, we really can't move forward if we don't talk about this number, and that is that 84% of lower extremity amputations in the U.S. are preceded by an ulceration. 84%. So it's not 2 o'clock in the morning from a horrible abscess. It's not 3 o'clock in the morning from a massive trauma. The, the far majority of amputations of the leg are a very slow burn progression over weeks, months, years worth of ulceration that end up in a decline at a point that amputation is necessary. So 84%. So we could literally prevent 84% of the amputations we're doing in this country if we could just heal ulcers better. So obviously we're going to talk a lot about that during the day, but we have to have those understandings of where this all comes from. This is, when we talk about limb loss in the diabetic foot, we know it's not the, what, what, uh, what Hollywood may portray it as a, at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, you must amputate or they're going to die. Uh, that still happens, but it's pretty rare. Uh, so what are those risk factors for ulceration? How can we dive into that and really take a look at this uh, and what does the evidence tell us? So on this slide I have for you some of the key bullet pointed literature proven evidence based risk factors for ulceration. Uh, the ones in red that are circled can be surgically corrected and removed from the slide. Uh, so that's a big part of what we're doing here together is that what's happening in these other rooms and these concurrent sessions can alleviate the vascular disease that is compromising the, the diabetic low extremity. Uh, the rest of the, the bullet-pointed uh, red ones are up to us. Uh, limited joint mobility, foot deformity, abnormal foot pressure. We may not be able to fix these, but we can accommodate for them, uh, both uh, with conservative means and with surgical means. Uh, so we'll talk about those uh, throughout the day and with a couple of my discussions as well. But it is exciting to apply and realize that some of the very, very simple foot surgeries and biomechanically corrective procedures that we've been doing since the inception of our specialty are actually most effective in the diabetic foot. Those are the patients that actually need them the most, but oftentimes are the ones that get them the least because we falsely label our patients with diabetes as high risk, bad blood flow, too medically ill, and they can't survive the surgery. Not true, and we'll talk about that a lot today with myself and the other speakers. Um, these are some of the patients in your practice that need those biomechanical corrected surgeries more so than the ones that present with pain, but we just haven't all made that switch yet in our head because they don't come in complaining of pain. Uh, but that ulceration is mechanical, most likely. And that is one, of, I know we have a, a good number of students and residents here with us this morning, that is one of my absolute uh, teaching pet peeves, which is always a great teaching point, is when a relatively early student or resident will come in or perhaps it's the first time they were tortured with having to be in my clinic for the day uh, and they'll come in and we'll, we'll go through the presentation and the student or resident will accurately come in and say Dr. Steinberg exam room six uh, diabetic foot ulcer great uh, what's next and the the discussion is that I'm looking for the etiology what's the cause of the ulceration and the answer is always neuropathy diabetes neuropathy diabetes neuropathy diabetes Thousands of patients with diabetes and neuropathy that don't have ulceration. You don't spontaneously ulcerate because you have numbness in your foot. 
you ulcerate because you have a mechanical deformity. So when someone presents to me with a diabetic foot ulceration, that's one of the first things I want to hear from them is not that they have diabetes, and yes, they have neuropathy, maybe they have compromised vascular status. What is the mechanical etiology that caused that ulcer? Why do they ulcerate under the first med instead of the fifth med? Why do they ulcerate on their heel versus the forefoot? What mechanically is going on here? Because that's one of the parts of the puzzle that we in this room are best equipped to fix and handle. Matter of fact, oftentimes we are the, the key link to fix and handle that part uh, of the problem. A lot of other things, my partner's a plastic surgeon, Chris Addinger, many of you know his name, he's incredibly well published, done a lot of pioneering work in limb salvage. He can cover any wound. He doesn't need me to skin graft, he doesn't need me to, to move skin around, he doesn't need me to do a V to Y flap or all these fancy things that we can do. Yes, we can all do that. That's done by lots of other folks in the hospital, but very few folks in the hospital understand and employ the biomechanical knowledge that we have. So that's one of those things that uh, I know I wasn't terribly excited about biomechanics in the early parts of my career. Now it all kind of clicks and I realize and I see the importance of that. So I really try to impress that upon students and residents early on to realize that that is the, the core of this. So the complications of diabetes, if we were to really oversimplify things, can be broken into two basic categories, microvascular uh, and macrovascular. Well, macrovascular is easy. We can see it, we can treat it, we can address it, uh, breaking down into to physical blockages and impairment of flow. The microvascular really is more of a physiologic compromise, and that's a little harder to deal with. Part of the microvascular pathway we can deal with, with what's happening in this building with endovascular work, but the other part of it really is physiologic. Uh, and some of that becomes a challenge of how do we actually improve the physiology of their blood flow and their cellular respiration? How do we go about this? Ulcerations are pivotal events in limb loss. So there are two key reasons why an ulcer will cause someone to lose their leg. Uh, number one, it's the opening or portal for infection uh, because our skin normally protects us from that. Uh, number two uh, is the fact that these patients in presence of critical ischemia end up with necrotic tissue. So if they cannot supply enough oxygen to heal this defect, uh, then we know that's going to go on to advancing ischemia and end up with gangrene and limb loss. So I promised you simple. Uh, here's really, really simple on the screen for you. Uh, if you start at the nine o'clock position uh, in someone who has diabetes with some slight biomechanical abnormality, which I guarantee if we did a foot exam on everybody in the room, we'd find 99% of you have some biomechanical abnormality and maybe one nuisance person would have a perfect foot. There's not very many perfect feet out there. I could come up with a diagnosis code on just about anybody's foot that comes into my office pretty easily. And not being a criminal, just saying that we know that people mechanically don't have perfect feet. Uh, I, in front of you, have to confess, I don't have perfect feet. Uh, high foot pressures are a problem, right? We all have them. And in the non-diabetic realm, it's a callus and a nuisance and a change in shoe gear and maybe a pair of orthotics. In the diabetic realm with neuropathy, that callus or skin trauma turns into ulceration because they don't feel the pain, they don't have the feedback from that, they don't change their walking patterns, they don't change their shoe gear, and therefore that ulceration in the face of vascular disease, which this meeting is pivoted around, is going to fail to heal, yield a local infection that goes on perhaps to a systemic infection and causes an amputation. Uh, the gray zone here uh, at this uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1 o'clock range is where I really like to thrust most of my effort in practice. If possible, uh, the goal of every one of us in the room here should be to stop these early on before they get to the phase of ulceration or before they get to the phase of non-healing ulceration. And we can do that uh, by prophylactic care. Uh, these patients can come in. I, if someone's diagnosed by medicine or endocrinology with diabetes, they get an automatic consult into my clinic. It's not a very exciting visit for me. It's not a very exciting visit for the patient, but it sets the tone of, you're at risk, I'm going to see you once every year, once every two years, and we're going to make sure that you have the basic fundamental knowledge of, you know where I'm at if you have a problem, you know the basics of what to do and not do as far as shoe gear and foot activity and what's wrong with your foot, and we do a biomechanical exam so we can start to talk about, hey, you already have a callus or an ulcer here, or you already have a tight Achilles tendon, here's what we're going to have to work on and follow over the coming years, and if some of this should manifest as a pre ulcerative lesion, here's some of the things we might do. And we talked to our patients early on about that so they understand that this is something that we can work together on. Uh, and setting that tone and helping them understand that we're going to be a partnership in this uh, makes a big difference. So again, this etiology of diabetic foot pathology, just a different way to look at it in case your mind works a little better this way. We know the neuropathy is a big part of this triad. Obviously, infection is what's going to perhaps set in in the face of skin breakdown and ulceration and cause uh, loss in combination with or perhaps independently the vascular insufficiency. 
but for the most part, this all works together along with some immune compromise, uh, yielding a higher rate of infection. So I love this uh, set of pictures here. This is the same patient uh, with the left and right foot pressure mapping in shoe analysis. Great stuff. Uh, eight labs readily available. NYCPM, I'm sure, works with this regularly. This is basic technology we've had for a few decades, but it really has failed to progress into the practical nature of us using, using it regularly on our patients. But I love what it does tell us. Uh, and in the research realm, realm, we use this quite regularly. So this in-shoe pressure analysis system, here's your taxpayer dollars, uh, very appropriately used in a patient with diabetes and pre-ulcerative breakdown in the forefoot. So a prescription for extra depth shoes and uh, custom molded inserts was appropriately written and dispensed. And you can see the, the left and right foot on the left set of images, very high pressure in the, in the forefoot and no real contact of the arch. Transfer over to the images on the right, same individual, improved, footwear, and the pressures have decreased. But have they decreased enough? Uh, this system that we're using here, depending on which system you use, but it's pretty uh, self-explanatory that the red zones are the pressures that are high enough to form an ulceration. The skin breakdown could cause an ulceration if that continues to be repetitive pressure. Uh, and in this individual, the inserts helped a lot. It was a worthy prescription, but we also have to be watchful that if we had this data with every pair of shoes that we wrote for, then we would know that, okay, this particular patient is only getting partial relief. I'm gonna to need to see this person a little more often because I'm really worried about what's gonna happen underneath that second and third metatarsal head of the left foot. The shoes helped, but they really didn't get the pressure down low enough to where I feel comfortable that they're gonna be a one-year follow-up. So it's a, it's a good kind of just a weather Doppler radar predictor of where we're at with these patients. And uh, I like it. Uh, the challenge, as I said, is it's not practical enough to be used regularly on our patients. Uh, but the hope is uh, that at some point this will become cheap enough and become regular enough to where when you prescribe a pair of custom molded inserts, the wireless technology and sensors are just built into the insert. It's not something you have to separately measure or do and that this will be part of the patient monitoring. So that's out there. Uh, and folks like Dave Armstrong and such are doing a lot of research on this with the with the. Um, at home data collection and, and mobile monitoring, uh, but it's just not cheap enough or practical enough to where we're doing it on every patient. Uh, three types of pressure. Uh, so foot ulceration and mechanics, the mechanism of injury here again, to dive a little deeper. So low pressure, decubitus ulceration, right? Patients bedridden, we know if they're not properly um, uh, surface pressure relief with a, a, uh, some type of boot or a special mattress, that they will eventually, if they're completely immobile, they will ulcerate the back of their heel uh, with uh, concerns for both pressure and ischemia. So that's constant low pressure would be an example of a decubitus ulceration. High pressure, this is gonna be a puncture wound or a trauma or a shoe injury uh, or, or something that was, a, that was a single event trauma, which happens on occasion. But the far majority of diabetic foot pathology is the repetitive moderate pressure basically translating to walking, right? So we need our patients walking. The uh, vascular specialists and cardiac specialists need the patients walking, but it becomes a big challenge when you have a biomechanical abnormality and a patient with diabetes neuropathy, now we're worried about every step. And rather than being excited about them taking 10 or 12 or 20,000 steps a day and giving them cardiac rewards, we're worried about that if they're taking 10 and 12 and 20,000 steps a day on a biomechanically compromised foot with neuropathy in bad shoes, we've got a problem. And that's where this moderate uh, repetitive pressure comes in for ulceration. Probably 80, 90% of the ulcers I see and you see likely are from moderate repetitive pressure. So uh, Dave Armstrong did some great work on this and published in JBJS actually in 1998. Uh, and this was a, a great discussion. And again, I love the simple stuff in diabetes because we don't need to make this too complicated. Alan Jacobs always makes it way too complicated. I don't know why, Alan, but uh, it's, uh, it's really a pretty simple science. And uh, when you look at the patients with diabetes who have no neuropathy, their newtons per centimeter square pressures are pretty much equivalent to a non-diabetic patient. But when you add neuropathy, uh, they bounce up. When you add the patient's history of ulceration, they bounce up higher. And when you add Charcot foot deformity, it's the highest that was measured in this group. So obviously progressing with foot deformity and getting back to biomechanics again uh, and realizing this really is about mechanical structure of the foot. So everybody has their share of nightmares uh, and we always love to show someone else's nightmares. And yes, I, this was not my case. I have plenty of cases that, uh, that may look similar to this on occasion, but this is what happens when you get into a bargaining game with your patient. 
right? And uh, the patient uh, says, no, I don't want you to amputate my healthy first and second toe. Uh, but you know where this is going and you know what's going to happen and you know the subsequent result of this. So we have to think biomechanically when we operate on these patients. Uh, I have example after example I can show you both from my practice and from others that have come in uh, where this just really wasn't followed to the degree that it should have been followed. So this situation of a, of a single digit that's uh, standing out there, we, we know it's going to be a pressure problem. We know it's going to break down. And so if you can create a biomechanically sound foot at the end of your surgery or your amputation, uh, this is certainly preferred. So briefly, uh, I, I did my fellowship uh, in 1998 at University of Texas Health Science Center. That was with Dave Armstrong and, and um, Larry Lavery was just leaving at the time. And uh, Lawrence Harkless, of course, is the founder of the program there. And uh, Dr. Harkless and Dr. Armstrong, uh, together with Dr. Lavery, published the UT Foot Risk Classification System. Uh, and we'll talk quickly about the wound classification system. That's out there as well, not so commonly used. But I would really uh, implore upon you that if you're seeing patients with diabetes, the first line of your assessment should be what the foot risk classification system is. I think that really, really helps. You can use whichever system you feel comfortable with. I find the UT system still to be super, super simple and very user-friendly. I have a quick text in my EMR for UT foot risk category one, two, three, four, five, six, and I just type in the number and it pops in a whole paragraph for me. I even put in the literature reference for what site I'm, what, uh, what reference I'm citing to show that this is an evidence-based classification. And I would tell you, many of us in the room um, do medical malpractice defense work and, and help folks who are, are in the midst of a, a malpractice lawsuit. This type of documentation is so helpful to show that you're not just shooting from the hip, that I'm not just guessing what to do for this patient with the diabetic foot. I'm not just randomly assigning them to come back in six months or two years or two weeks, or um, this is the person I prescribed shoes for and this is the person I didn't. That's actually all in this paper as to a basic framework with evidence basis and outcomes basis of how you should treat the patients coming into your practice with diabetes. It just sets the basic framework and stage with some, some evidence behind it. So I find it really, really helpful to show that I'm not just assigning you to come back in two years because I'm not worried about you uh, randomly. I'm doing that because it's actually published in the literature. Uh, so we'll go through these real quick and, uh, and what, show you what they mean. They're super, super quick. There's no big complicated pathway to, to end up with a category for these folks. So UT category zero is a patient who has been diagnosed with diabetes but has great sensation, good blood flow, no mechanical problems. Their, their foot pretty much looks like anyone else's foot. It's not a problem. They really are not significantly increased risk uh, for ulceration. So this is the patient, again, you look through the published work on this and it'll tell you uh, thoughts on, on when you'll see this patient back. This is the patient that comes back every one to two years. They, they have diabetes, but I don't need to see you. You're doing great. Uh, if or when you develop neuropathy, we might get a little more attentive to this. Um, Flip to category two, maybe five, 10 years down the road for someone who's not getting optimal control or maybe even someone who has perfect control and they just have bad disease, um, they will develop sensory neuropathy. Uh, now, do you count pins and needles and tingling sensation in this? I do, uh, because we know that shortly after that is gonna become sensory loss. Uh, but technically this category is about sensory loss. So if they fail the Sims-Weinstein monofilament, if they lose their vibration perception threshold, uh, these are folks who have true sensory loss and have a significant elevation, they're twice as likely to ulcerate as someone in category zero. Uh, everybody thinks this picture is fake and I just, I, I, I love this picture because it really tells the story of diabetes. This is literally a patient with neuropathy who came in for his six month checkup when I was a fellow in San Antonio, Texas. And everybody thinks I'm lying and they think it's fake. And it's, true story, came in for six month follow up and he had a scheduled appointment, and the week prior he was having some kitchen cabinet work done. He thought he might have stepped on something uh, the night before. Uh, he came in for his visit. He wasn't really sure, but believe it or not, this guy somehow got his shoes and socks on uh, and, and, uh, and made his way in for his regularly scheduled visit. This is not a picture from the ER. This was not an add-on emergency visit. Patient has a nail on his toe and must see you. This gentleman literally came in uh, for a six-month checkup. and. Uh, it becomes believable when you think about the fact that, okay, he has total sensory loss. Uh, he has significant vision loss, uh, so he couldn't really see this. Uh, and uh, the reality is that, you know, it's, it's just a situation of really, really bad luck. 
but this is literally what he came in with. And thankfully, it was not bony trauma. It was just soft tissue trauma. We opened that up, uh, did a little incision and drainage, uh, irrigated in the clinic, put him on some oral antibiotics, and he was fine. We didn't have to hospitalize him. But very interesting um, concept and reminds me of the quote at the bottom from Paul Brand, who we know did a tremendous amount of work in neuropathy um, and said that pain is the gift that no one wants. So obviously, if any of us uh, had this, we would have responded right away. So category two uh, in the UT system would be patients that have neuropathy or sensory loss, uh, and now they have deformity. So combine that with any of these biomechanical diagnoses that uh, you could find on pretty much any of our feet, uh, and you have category two, neuropathy with deformity, those patients are 12 times more likely to ulcerate than they would be if they're in category zero. So just setting the stage here for as this uh, causation pathway starts to get worse and worse, uh, UT category two. Uh, category three is a very, very common uh, top line diagnosis in my clinic, uh, and that is with history of pathology. So these are patients who have had a prior ulcer, no current ulcer, but a prior ulcer, a prior amputation, or a prior episode of acute charco or charco midfoot breakdown or, or charco breakdown in any part of the foot. Uh, so category three, history of pathology, neuropathic related diabetic foot pathology. These patients are 36 times more likely to have a repeat ulceration. Uh, or amputation. So these are the folks that really we're going to see very, very often, probably in the two-month range, monitor them closely, really be heavy on their prescriptions for footwear, and be very heavy on any kind of prophylactic surgery we could be doing to address the subsequent mechanics that might be changing as their foot uh, gets farther and farther out from their ulcer or their amputation history. Uh, category four. So now we're moving in the UT system from risk factors for ulceration to risk factors for amputation. So the top three, one, two, and three, were risk factors for ulceration. The bottom three are risk factors for amputation. I don't use the bottom three as often because they're in the hospital at that point, most likely, or they're getting active care. Uh, but the 4A category would still be a clinic-based patient, and the 4B would still be a clinic-based patient because those are the ulcer and charco categories, but both active. If either of these were healed at this time from this episode, they'd go back to a category three. Uh, once you get to a category uh, three, you never go down back down to a one or a two, obviously, because you always have that history. Category five and six are hospitalized patients. Usually this is active infection uh, and ischemic limb that either gets revascularized or is going to become an amputation. So those, again, are more risk factors for amputation and used in the hospital. Uh, wound classification system, pick whatever works well for you. Uh, some folks are still more comfortable with a very, very simple Wagner scale. I, I have nothing against a Wagner scale. M many folks have evolved onto the Wi-Fi system, which is great. Uh, a little more complicated for me and uh, uh, I, not really one of my preferred, but it, whatever works for you in your practice is great and, and go with that. I, uh, again, I'm a product of San Antonio, so I use the UT diabetic wound classification system. Uh, essentially, you have to look at uh, what's the depth What's the infection and is there ischemia? Those are the three questions that you would ask yourself to end up with a, uh, classifying the wound under UT. It has a number and a letter, as you can see here from the scale. Uh, very, very linear progression as you go from a grade zero A ulcer or a non-ulcer uh, to a, a grade three or down to bone with ischemia and infection. Uh, almost 100% prevalence of amputation when someone's diagnosed with a grade three D ulcer. So if you come in, and, and that was one of the, the landmark things about this original paper, was to show that this really is a fairly linear progression as you start adding on ulcer depth, and you add on ischemia, and you add on infection, you go from zero rate of amputation to almost 100 rate of amputation. Uh, so very, very straightforward science here again to show you the simplicity uh, that we're up against here with the diabetic foot. So how do, we, uh, how do we get from A to B? How do we get from left to right? Uh, this is one of the hardest ulcers to heal in my practice is a plantar heel ulceration. Uh, these are folks who are walking and ambulatory. These are not posterior heel ulcers. These would be probably the non-ambulators and the decube sitting. So plantar heel ulcers, very, very difficult. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, if there's infection and probing the bone, uh, then we've got some options as far as a calconectomy and surgical approach. Uh, if it's not infected, not probing the bone, we're probably going to want to try to heal it without surgery. Uh, but uh, there's, it's a challenge, a real challenge. Uh, the offloading has gotten a lot better uh, with crow and owl boots now, where we can do a lot more to take the pressure off the heel. But obviously, you can't weight bear without putting pressure on the heel. Uh, so these can be a real, real challenge. But this patient actually was healed with an owl boot. Uh, and, uh, and now we're going to go back. Now that the wound is healed, we're going to go back and do a little percutaneous uh, excess and planing of the heel uh, to try to prevent this from recurring. 
uh, this patient, uh, another scenario of how do we go from, from uh, A to B, how do we go from left to right uh, to help these patients chaperone through healing? A lot of technology out there. We're going to talk about that. We're going to look at some of the, some of the graphs that we should be using, some of the biologics we should be using. Uh, but again, the core of this is mechanics. Uh, and this patient, uh, what was needed here, you can probably predict already, uh, of what I'm going to say was a tendo Achilles lengthening. Uh, if we can address Aquinas and we can take some of that pressure off the forefoot, at that point, the grafts and the dressings and whatever topicals you want to put on, those are all great and helpful, but it becomes more of a supplement rather than the core treatment. Uh, this, this was a, a wound that was longstanding, obviously partial first ray amputation, addressing this from the mechanical perspective and realizing this patient has significant limitation of dorsiflexion at the ankle uh, becomes a real game changer uh, for this individual. So, uh, no, we're not having McDonald's delivered for lunch today. Uh, but yes, uh, my inpatients now supplement their hospital menu with Uber Eats very regularly. So it used to be one of the advantages of having a patient, unfortunately, in the hospital or a diabetic foot infection was at least we could control what they were eating and what their nutrition was. And this could be a chance for them to finally get back on the rails and really take a, a look at what they're eating and how uh, this is being processed by their body. But now, thanks to Uber Eats and food delivery, uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and this is my patient. Again, it, it's, it's really uh, unfortunate about how this has, has become such a challenge for us. But most patients with diabetes in my practice that have foot ulcers are obese. And uh, we don't spend any time treating this. It's really hard to get paid for. It sometimes seems very futile. There's that worriness about feeling like you're rude or saying something you shouldn't say. Uh, it, it's a real, real challenge. But I would tell you, when you look at this, this is, this is one person's order. This is not, this is two separate days, day after day uh, that I took in the, this is legitimate pictures from the inpatient room at Georgetown. Uh, and this is one patient who ordered on day one, it was five ketchup packets, which I think, uh, Alan, usually go with six, six packets? Minimum. Minimum six. Uh, the the uh, two large strawberry shakes with extra whipped cream. Don't forget the extra whipped cream. Uh, just one filet of fish, uh, two mustard packets, one triple cheeseburger, but don't forget the 10 Splendas. So we got, if the Splendas in there, then it must be healthy, right? Because we did the milkshakes, but we got the Splenda. I don't know what the Splenda was being put on uh, because there's nothing here that needs any sweetener anymore. Uh, and then the next day was pretty similar. Two filet of fish, 10 Splendas again, uh, one strawberry cream pie, one McDouble, and two large strawberry shakes again with the extra whipped cream. Same patient, uh, two consecutive days. Uh, we're not going to make it if we keep doing this, right? This is, this is a real problem. And I would tell you, I don't profess here that I have figured this out for my patients. Uh, I know it's a big challenge for the country and the world, but um, the reality is that we're, we're up against a, a real wall here because it, it, the obesity factor for mechanics and the impact on the foot is a big deal. We all know that it impacts pain and plantar fasciitis and mechanical deformity. It's a big, big deal in diabetes. Um, this is my partner, Chris Adinger, uh, doing a baloney amputation. Uh, he does a marvelous, well-performed baloney amputation. Uh, but the reality is that if we do our job correctly, we identify that causal pathway for diabetes more rapidly and more consistently, and we treat that more consistently, like we're going to talk about today, um, we can do a better job of having Chris Adinger and many others do less and less baloney amputations. There's so much more we can do before it gets to that point. Uh, and I think that's just really, really key. Uh, so I hope today sets uh, so kind of some, a little bit of the stage with what we're talking about. Again, this is a simple problem. Don't make diabetes and diabetic food, food complications any more complicated than they are. Uh, it's very straightforward science. I think it's really, really fun and exciting science because there's so much that we can do uh, and that all of us are here to talk to you about today uh, throughout the day with, with some of these great technologies and what we can do. It really, really is, although perhaps you kind of this first talk maybe wasn't super uplifting with some of my, uh, some of my concerns of what we're up against. Uh, I think it really is uplifting uh, because the difference we can make uh, in these patients' lives and the lives of their family and their caretakers is huge. Uh, and it's getting better on a daily basis. We've got technology, we've got skills, and we've got understanding now of what we can do for these individuals with their challenges. So thank you all very much for the welcome.